Hi everyone, this is Mark DuPont, producer of Macro Musings. As another year of wide-ranging episodes comes to an end, I hope you've enjoyed listening as much as I have. We've been incredibly privileged to have an abundance of fantastic guests on the podcast this year, so if you love macroeconomics and want to keep the conversations going, please consider making a financial contribution this holiday season before the end of the year at donate.mercatus.org backslash podcasts. That's donate.mercatus.org backslash podcasts. Any donation you submit will go towards the production of the show, including new episodes released every Monday, more in-person recordings once it's safe to hold them again, and open transcripts of every episode enhanced with helpful resources. Additionally, anyone who donates $75 or more or any monthly donation of $5 or more will receive the coveted, one-of-a-kind, Macro Musings and GDP targeting mug. Yes, the mug. Again, please support the show at donate.mercatus.org backslash podcasts. Thank you, and on to the show. Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Hello, longtime listeners of the Macro Musings podcast. My name is David Andelfado of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and I'll be filling in for David Beckworth today. Our guest today is none other than the creator of this podcast, David Beckworth himself. Good morning, David, and welcome to your show. Well, thank you, David. It's a real honor to have a Federal Reserve official interview me on this podcast. Well, it's really, really great to be here. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you, David, after extending the favor to me, at least on a few occasions. So before we get into economics, I'd like to take a little bit of time just to talk about you and your background, and in particular, what motivated you to become an economist and how you ended up at the Mercatus Center. Well, I'll try to keep this short. But in college, I went to a small institution, small liberal arts school. They didn't even have an economics major. I was a business major. I took the prerequisite macro and micro. And I really, really loved macroeconomics. It just clicked. In fact, I remember sitting with some of my friends who were we considered the brainiacs in the group. And I was doing as well or better than them on the exams. They were all shocked. I was shocked. It didn't register, hey, maybe you could do this as a career until much later in life. In fact, I went on and was working on an MBA This is in the late 90s. And I took another macro course and it just really clicked again and it started me thinking, I really enjoyed that as an undergrad. I'm really enjoying it now in the master's level program. And at the same time, I was reading, believe it or not, Paul Krugman's work. He had a lot of interesting stuff out. Like, I believe the book was called Pop Internationalism, but basically it was him going off on all these international trade cranks. It was really excellent reading. He wrote a lot for foreign affairs, too. And I, so I found that really fascinating. It seemed to make sense of the world in a systematic way. And then the other thing I remember very vividly is I bought a used copy of the book, The Secrets of the Temple, by William Grider. So it's a very populist book, but it's a well-written book. It's one of these books that you know, journalists put together, inside accounts of what happened during the Volcker years at the Fed. Man, I was motivated by this. And in fact, I remember one time riding the subway, reading the book, and a lady stopped and asked, what are you reading? You know, turns out she was a consultant for McKinsey, and so she kind of knew what I was talking about and stuff. But just really, all these little pieces of the puzzle coming together, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I like this. I'm going to do it. And then I headed off to grad school. And as it turns out, I ended up at a place where George Selgin was working, and he became my major professor, like on my dissertation committee and such. But I had him, he taught some classes as well that I took. So it was really just, you know, serendipity that I ended up at the place where he was. So he kind of, you know, broadened my thinking even more. And then many years later, he and I ended up both working in a similar place in D.C., you know, in the think tank space. Now, how did I get to Mercatus? Well, I was working at state universities. I was at Western Kentucky University, before that at Texas State University. So my career path was kind of low-key, regional state school. I was a man of the people, David. I was there with the proletariat, (laughs) (laughs) hanging with the masses. In fact, I don't know if you've ever heard this story, David. I, I once taught a very famous baseball player named Paul Goldschmidt. Maybe you've heard this story. 
I have not. Yeah, he was in my money in banking class, and he was extremely bright. The baseball fans out there know him. He's one of the best first basemen in Major League Baseball. But I had a lot of student athletes come through at institutions like this, big state schools. Anyway, he was really bright in money and banking. He was a finance major. They had to take the class. And we had actually another class that we offered, and it was a portfolio management class. He actually managed real money as an undergrad. But it was a competitive class to get into it. And I said, look, Paul, I will recommend you to the professors teaching this class because you are like the best student in here. And he was really torn and he thought about it and he came back to me. He goes, Dr. Beckworth, I really want to do this, but I got baseball. (laughs) And I said, baseball? Are you serious? And I gave him a little spiel about what are the chances of you becoming a professional baseball player versus becoming someone on Wall Street. And I tried to tell him how this class was amazing. You know, all the students who went through it got good internships, went to work for Goldman Sachs, went to Wall Street. I said, this is the path you need to take. And later word got out. And of course, the faculty, they all laughed that I made this recommendation to him. And in fact, when I was at Western Kentucky University, before I came to Mercatus, I got an email from Paul Goldschmidt. And he says, Dr. Beckworth baseball turned out okay. (laughs) Oh, anyways, he burned me, but he's really a good sport. We chatted and, you know, caught up and stuff. So yeah, so that's where I've been working at before I came to Mercatus. But what I also was doing was a lot of blogging and writing op-eds, popular stuff. And that's where we first met was in the blogosphere, David, back in the kind of the aftermath of the Great Recession. You know, that just really opened up doors for me. And I think for all of us who participated in that, that blogging, I got to meet people like you. It opened up opportunities for interviews. The internet was this great leveling field. I didn't have to be at a top 10 department to be a part of the conversation. And so the blogging led to op-eds, which eventually led to this opportunity at Mercatus where I am now. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that baseball story. You know, I've been doing a little bit of research here. And according to my notes, this is the 314th episode of your Macro Musings podcast. Is that correct? That is correct. And you broadcast your first episode on March 31st, 2016. Your guest at that time was Scott Sumner. And I think a lot of people are, might be curious, myself included, I mean, how you came up with the idea for this podcast. And, you know, I've also been a little bit curious to know how you came up with its name as well. The name actually followed my blog. My blog was called Macro Musings. And so I just said, let's run with that. We'll be musing about macro stuff. And as listeners know, it's macro, it's finance. It's, we get into the operational details of central banking and such. But the reason that I mean, I, I wanted to come up with this podcast, because at the time, it was 2016, as you mentioned, there were a lot of good podcasts out there and ones that I listened to. In fact, there were even economics podcasts, but none of them, at least the ones that I was aware of, focus kind of singly on just macro and financial issues. So I thought well, this would be kind of a nice gap to fill, a niche to fill. No one else is doing it, so I'm not competing against anyone. I can be the first one out the door. Now, there are other ones out there now, but at the time, there wasn't, at least that I was aware of. And so I got into it, and it worked out great. Interestingly, I when I was doing this, this is in 2016, so this is right when I started at Mercatus. I have two bosses. Well, I have multiple bosses, but two at the very top. Tyler Cowan, which many listeners will know. He's, of course, a big name from GMU, but he's also the head of Mercatus. And then I have another boss, Dan Rothschild, kind of the operational boss. But they took me out to lunch. Actually, I was doing a sabbatical there, and then they're going to offer me a full-time job. But in the process of this lunch, I brought up the idea of doing a podcast on macroeconomics. And they both kind of looked at each other, looked at me and like, oh, I don't know, David, <laughs> maybe seven, eight episodes we could see you, you know, squeezing out of that. And and I think maybe what they were thinking was Dave is going to do, you know, seven episodes on nominal GDP level targeting and that's it, you know. And I was like, no, no, no. What I want to do is something that kind of keeps up with current events, looks at literature, looks at all the unsolved questions, the history. There's so much, as you know, in macro that's unresolved and new things occur all the time. We have not had a boring moment these past two years of the pandemic. So there's constantly great material for the show. So I just feel privileged and delighted that I get to do it. Yeah, well, we certainly derive a great benefit from it. But I mean, what in particular motivates you to produce the podcast? Because it must be a lot of work. You produce a lot of episodes per year. Yeah, it is a lot of work. And, you know, it does take away from me doing research you know so before coming here and doing research like i just got tenure at western kentucky university before i came i still do research but the podcast does seem to take up a lot of my time but there's a trade-off involved i'll come back to that maybe when i give you my last answer so let me answer your question your question what motivates me to do it i'd say three things first is simply i enjoy it it's fun 
it's actually invigorating. I'm looking forward to conversations and kind of you, know, you wake up, oh, I'm going to talk to David Andofalo today, you know. You kind of get going. And any of these guests, I feel that way. You know, I have to read their work, read their articles. Sometimes it's a big book, you know. I'll confess, in some big books, I've learned to skim very effectively because there's a lot of work that goes into this. But I just really enjoy it, and, and it challenges my thinking. I've had, for example, some post-Keynesians on the show, and we've debated what's the best way to deal with inflation. So, for example, we debated what Paul Volcker did in the early 80s. You know, was that necessary? Or, of course, they would suggest you know, the traditional approach, you know, increase interest rates, tighten fiscal policy, tighten monetary policy. They would go more towards like doing price and wage controls, which I find to be very troubling. But I've had interesting conversations. They push back, you know, against what I think. But so I just find it challenging, invigorating. That'd be the first thing. And I enjoy it. And again, you know, get to talk to interesting people like you and the others on the show. The other thing I derive from this is it, it gives me research ideas. You know, it helps me think of new ideas, new things. And I know we'll talk later about a working paper I've just finished. And that came from conversations with you, specifically Ricardo Caballero, Al Simsek, Adam Posen, and others talking about safe assets. And, and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't done the podcast. Finally, the third thing I want to come back to what I was saying earlier is I like doing the podcast, David, because it's a way around the gatekeepers of the profession. You know, I don't have a great pedigree, as you know, I come from a state school, but this podcast has allowed me to be a part of a national conversation. I get invited to conferences I probably wouldn't have otherwise been invited to. I get to speak to people I probably wouldn't have otherwise spoken to. And I like to think I'm a part of a broader conversation, whereas the typical traditional path would be go to a top school, get published in the top journals, and then people will start to take you seriously. And maybe you can write an op-ed and do all that. And for me, I have found, you know, this alternative route has worked out much better for me. So it's been a real, you know, opportunity and privilege for me to be a part of this conversation via the podcast. Wow. I mean, I think you're probably going to motivate a lot of people to start their own podcasts, including myself. I mean, <laughs> So this has been like quite a success, I would say. And, you know, I hear that you have fans of your show from all over the world. And I'm sure you get stopped in the street and asked for autographs. Isn't that right? <laughs> no, I have not been stopped in the street <laughs> for an autograph. I have been asked for autographs, but not like that. I think I've signed one autograph just for the record. So no, but I'm nowhere near that level. But I do get stopped and approached by lots of people at conferences and other you know, big gatherings for economists, which we haven't had in a while. So for example, back at the last AEA in person in San Diego, you know, January 2020, I went to a party that the Bank of England was hosting. I believe it was Saturday night. All these central banks are hosting parties. And I went to the Bank of England. I'll, I'll tell you why, because it was open to anyone. It's like, well, I'm going to go crash that party. Party. You know, I'm going to go see who I can find there. And I found some friends there. But lo and behold, I had multiple people from the Bank of England come up to me and say, hey, David, we listened to your show. One of them actually, you know, said, my wife is a big fan. She's not here. And if I don't get my picture taken with you, she'll be very upset. And as it turned out, his name was Arthur Terrell. He ended up coming on the podcast this year. He's a nuclear fusion scientist. I'll encourage listeners to go check that out. But stories like that are pretty fun, pretty amazing. I also, you know, have been approached at conferences by Fed staffers and just other people who listen to the show. I've had several prominent members of the Fed leadership. I'll say at least two governors <laughs> tell me they listen to the show and, you know, give them some feedback on it. And I'd say probably where I see most of the reception and engagement is from people on Twitter, as well as graduate students. I get a lot of graduate students reaching out to me. So I think part of what I'm doing and what we're doing at Mercatus with the podcast is, you know, reaching the next generation of young, you know, macro economists and hopefully pointing them in, in a good direction. Right. Fantastic. I think by any measure, that's success in my books. Well, you know, in light of the guests, let's say the guests that you've had just this past year, 2021, what would you say were some of the best insights or ideas that you learned from your guests this year? Well, I have a few, but I, I could, you know, probably draw lessons from all the shows. So this is, you know, not going to do justice to what we covered, but some things that really resonate. Maybe this is, again, recency bias, things that just really stuck out in my mind because of my own research agenda. But I'll start with Ricardo Rice. I had him on the show and he's always high energy, interesting to listen to. He's an amazing researcher. He seems to produce a lot of output. But we were talking about the global dollar system and how the Fed had bailed it out, you know, essentially, or maybe that's a strong word, had backs 
backstop the global dollar funding markets in March 2020. And there's a lot of people who have concerns about that, that the Fed's always going to have to step in whenever there's a panic. It did in 2008. It did in 2020 and probably will have to do so again in the future. You know, and are we not just, you know, incentivizing more risky behavior? Is there a way to maybe get those shadow banks, those shadow dollar markets into the formal system? And so there is that real concern. And I brought it up with him, but he said, you know, David, you got to do the right counterfactual. And he referenced a paper by Matteo Maggiore, which we had on later in the year on the podcast, a paper by him and the late Emmanuel Fari, where they take a model and they show if you don't have a dominant currency like we have now with the dollar, you could have multiple currency regimes around the world, which could actually lead to greater financial instability. So he said, you know, that's not necessarily the outcome. That is one outcome that comes from their model. So he goes, it's not clear that an alternative world would be better. He goes, it might even be more financially unstable. So the global dollar system we have with all its bugs and issues may be the best thing we could hope for, which I, I found a very profound insight that I hadn't considered. So that'd be my first one. The other one, and this is tied to some of our conversations too, David, but I had Marcus Brunermeyer on and, and Hanno Lustig, and they kind of reshaped my thinking of the fiscal theory of the price level. Again, you have two, but Marcus Brunermeyer in particular has this paper, Fiscal Theory of the Price Level with a Bubble. And I know there's controversy about the bubble and, you know, is it really something meaningful or not? But what he shows is, you know, the fiscal theory of the price level doesn't do a good job explaining places like Japan, at least on the surface. Now, I know there's ways to resolve it if you're very clever. But the way he resolved it is to say, look, there's a bubble term that we're leaving now, the more general approach. And, you know, once you do that, it's, it makes more sense. But the thing I find fascinating about including that other term, whether you call it a bubble or a wedge in that equation, the fiscal theory of the price level, let me step back and explain that equation. I know David knows what I'm talking about. For listeners, fiscal theory of the price level has this key equation. It's, it's basically a government intertemporal budget constraint that's been iterated forward through infinity. And what it says is, look, the real value of government debt today is equal to expected future primary surpluses discounted to the present. And the idea is that, you know, if the government can't finance itself, can't pay for this debt in the future, inflation is going to occur and it cause the real value of those securities to adjust and therefore, you have inflation or deflation, depending on the, the outcome. But what Marcus Brunermeyer and what Hanno Lustig pointed to was that can't be all of it. There's got to be more. And that's where that wedge term or that bubble term comes in. And the way I've come to appreciate it, in fact, David, you pointed me to a paper by your former colleague and now governor, Chris Waller, that that term, that bubble term can be viewed as the demand for these securities, the real demand for it. And that's an important consideration. And to me, it, it kind of brings back kind of a quantity theory. And I know you've written on that. So anyways, that'd be the second thing. And then if I had something else to add, I don't want to go on too long here. Let me add maybe more of a casual anecdote. <laughs> so much a powerful insight. But I had Augustine Karsten on the show, and he's now, I guess, the leader, the president of BIS. But he also has been the IMF, and he was the head of the Bank of Mexico for many years. And so I asked him, what's the difference between being a central banker in the advanced economies and emerging markets, you know, places like Mexico? And he goes, David, you know, we're like street fighters. <laughs> Advanced central bankers, they're very, you know, proper and, you know, do things in the right. We're street fighters. We get out and we have a knockdown mixed martial art match with the markets. And, and that's probably the, the way he described it. I found that to be a very powerful illustration. There are many other things I could go into, but I'll stop there for the sake of time. And I apologize to all the other shows I didn't get to. But again, a lot of interesting stuff we covered. And those topics are ones that maybe speak to my heart near and dear because I'm doing research on them. Yeah, sure. That was a bit of an unfair question. I know that every one of your guests and podcasts are interested in their own right. I was just wondering if anything stood out. Now, you were interviewed actually once before on this podcast by Cardiff Garcia back in 2019. And, and that you guys were talking about your venue paper on nominal GDP targeting. I recall that was a fun interview and we learned a lot about why you've been such a big proponent of nominal GDP targeting for many years now. I went back and I read the transcript of that show there and I see that even then you could see that the Fed was not likely to adopt the proposal. And indeed, as we know, they went with the average inflation targeting framework instead. So can you tell us just briefly how the two frameworks are similar and how they differ? And also how you think the Fed's average inflation targeting framework performed over this last year? And whether your own preferred proposal, a nominal GDP targeting framework, would have resulted in anything materially different 
I will begin to answer that three-part question by saying I think they are in practice very similar, although on the surface they're very different. One's an average inflation target. The other one is you know, explicitly targeting total spending or total dollar incomes in the economy. But let me explain how I think they're very similar. And, and I think this is the way that the Fed is doing this average inflation. In fact, you know, the Fed likes to call it the flexible average inflation targeting. That little qualifier there gives it some extra degrees of freedom. And You know, if you look at what I consider to be the intellectual forefathers of this, I would go back to Ben Bernanke. Ben Bernanke had his temporary price level target. Rich Clarita, the the vice chair of the Board of Governors, said in later speeches, this is effectively a temporary price level targeting approach. But if you look at Bernanke's early note on this, maybe it was a blog post he did on this, he said that, you know, you want to do level targeting, effectively catch up or make up policy when you're at the zero lower bound. But when you get back to, you know, the normal path and you're outside the zero lower bound, it's back to regular inflation targeting. And also, he said, you want to ignore temporary inflation spikes or movements caused by supply shocks or energy changes that will fade, which is very interesting. And then later, Rich Clarita said the same thing, that, you know, it's an asymmetric approach. You can see through supply shocks. If you kind of put those pieces all together, what they're saying is you want to run demand really hot after real big demand shocks so you get away from the zero lower bound, and then you kind of go back to the normal level. You don't want to overreact to supply shocks. Well, that's exactly what a nominal GDP target does. In stabilizing demand, you're not worried about what's happening to inflation in the near term. Over the long term, of course, you hopefully keep it anchored. But you know the way at least those two individuals described it, I think, makes it very similar in spirit. In fact, your boss, David, when this was passed, I have a video clip I've saved of him where he said, you know, average inflation targeting is very much in the spirit of nominal GDP level targeting, price level targeting. So I think they're very similar in practice. And in fact, if you look at nominal GDP right now. It looks like, you know, if I didn't know any better, I didn't know anything. I just looked at the graph of nominal GDP targeting. You told me that there'd been a recession. I'd say, wow, they must be doing some kind of, you know, level targeting, maybe even nominal GDP level targeting. So maybe to jump ahead to your second question, I think, you know, nothing's perfect. There's ways things could have been done better. But overall, I'd say, man, take the win. What an accomplishment. We had a quick recovery from a very deep recession. Now, it was both fiscal policy and monetary policy, but the Fed could have really messed things up. It could have tightened preemptively, and it didn't. And compare that to 2008, the recovery from that, I'd say, wow, take the win. What an accomplishment. We did not have widespread bankruptcy. We didn't have another great financial crisis. And I hope the big takeaway from this year as we move forward is not the inflation surge, but the victory we accomplished, you know, the feat of returning the dollar size of the economy back to its trend path. You know, I guess if I had to say how they're different and maybe how my approach would have been different, probably not a lot, except for I would like to think more clarity. I think if you explicitly target a nominal GDP level target, you're being a little more clear about it. And I think it's fair. You can't speak to this, David, given your position, but I think it's fair that there is a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty about what the Fed means. Now, for me, I think I can divine it pretty clearly. They're going to respond like a nominal GDP targeter would, but there's so many people out there who didn't get that. I mean, smart people commenting on markets completely, I think, miss this leveled nature to it, number one, and then number two that you see through supply side shocks. I think clarity would be the big distinguishing thing. And and I know critics will say, well, nominal GDP targeting also has its communication challenges. So again, no perfect world. I guess to kind of wrap up this part of your question, you know, again, take the win. This was an amazing accomplishment for policymakers. Hopefully we learn from it. So you're happy. You're I am recently yeah. satisfied. Especially when you consider where we could be right now. Where we could be. Well, you're you're so pragmatic. <laughs> you know, as it turns out, you have a new paper that begins kind of with this startling question. Uh, the very first sentence is a question, what causes inflation? Now, surely economists like yourself and central bankers like myself know what causes inflation. Or do we? Can you tell us what motivated you to write this paper? Yeah. Now, this paper has taken a long time to write, in part because I've been doing too many podcasts. <laughs> no. This paper actually has marinated. That's maybe a better word. Got lots of great input, including people like you. You've corrected some really egregious directions I was going in that paper. But the reason I asked that question is because if you recall, you know, around 
2012 to maybe 2019, there was this inflation mystery. Why was inflation below the Fed's target? In fact, I, I look at 2010 to 2019, but on average, the PCE inflation was maybe 50 basis points or so below the Fed's 2% target. And there was a lot of coverage of this. In fact, in the article, I, I go back and I count up all the news stories and you see this huge spike in 2013 comes down a little bit, but it's still, there's lots of coverage on this inflation mystery. And I mean, there were newspaper articles with titles like the inflation quagmire, the inflation mystery, the inflation puzzle, the Fed's greatest challenge. Even Fed officials begin to say these things as well. I have some quotes in the paper. And so that kind of is the big motivation. Why was inflation low? In fact, I went to a conference at Brookings, I believe late 2019, one of the last conferences I've been to, and they had a whole conference on this, why the low inflation and they went through a litany of things, you know, from flat Phillips curves, labor market issues, globalization, technology. I felt at the end of the day that it was incomplete. There was something I think it was very obvious, it was screaming to me, and I and actually raised this question in the Q&A, didn't really get a good answer. But for me, that missing piece of the puzzle was the safe asset shortage story. And I'll come back to that, that idea in a minute, but I just wasn't satisfied with the answers that were being given at the conference and by Fed officials. So I don't know if this is a fair interpretation, but my sense of what the Fed officials kind of settled on, some of them, I don't think your boss did, but many of them settled on, I think they Knowledge, it's not a complete answer, but a lot of them settled on was a flat Phillips curve. That's kind of the most common explanation I saw. And then along with that, you know, the Fed itself is a victim of its success in anchoring inflation expectations. And I just didn't find those stories very helpful in understanding what happened 2010, 2019 for several reasons. First, there's been a lot of recent workout, not a lot, but some important workout recently on Phillips curves. So Emmy Nakamura, John Steinstein, Jonathan Hazel, and Juan Hirano had this paper showing that the U.S. Phillips curve is flat all the way back to the 1980s. The BIS has a nice graph of a Phillips curve for advanced economies that shows it's been flat for several decades as well. I think you can make the case Phillips curves have been flat for a long time. So why suddenly in 2010? The timing doesn't line up. There's got to be more to the story. The other thing is it's a global phenomenon. There's low inflation going on around the world, not just the US and Europe, Japan. And finally, the other thing that some Fed officials were hanging their explanation on, you know, we've anchored inflation expectations that's why it's so low. If you look at inflation expectations around the world, they're also beginning to gradually drift down during this time. It wasn't just headline inflation or core inflation. It was inflation expectations. So inflation expectations weren't as firmly anchored as they thought. So putting those pieces together, to me, the safe asset story made the most sense of it. And I don't know. Do you want me to get into the theory or do you have something? Well, to I was just going to say, so you've identified kind of the issues yeah. here, the phenomenon of this low inflation, quote unquote, puzzle, the various hypotheses of, that have been brought to bear on the question and your general dissatisfaction with all of these explanations, at least to some degree. So I was going to ask, like, what sort of theoretical framework did you bring to bear on this issue? I mean, you, you mentioned the safe assets, asset shortage phenomenon. Maybe take a little bit of time to explain what this framework is and kind of an, how it helps you interpret this low inflation episode. Yeah. Before I get to maybe the theory, let me just describe the safe asset shortage phenomenon. So, and I think many of our listeners will know since I've had many guests on talking about this, but around the world, there was effectively a dearth or a shortage of safe stores of value, securities that would maintain their value in a very large you know, financial crisis, some kind of systemic event. And of course, U.S. Treasuries fit that description. So do German government bonds and Japanese government bonds. Their nominal value, right? Excuse They're me. Nominal. Yeah, the nominal value. Yes. Thank you. Not the real value, the nominal value. It's a nominal value that's going to be expected to be preserved in a severe crisis. And treasuries have been the biggest you know, portion of that. And there's been people doing a lot of work on this. Ricardo Caballero and his colleagues have kind of traced this. In fact, Ricardo traces this shortage all the way back to Japan in the 90s when they had their big bubble and it burst. And he said that was the first incident of there being a relative shortage of safe assets. They never fully recovered in terms of the supply. And then he goes on to tell other stories, which is also common in the literature. I'll list a few of them. Demographics. Demographics is another reason. And what that does, it increases the demand for safe assets. Now, can I just back up a sure. second there? You mentioned Caballero in Japan as being the first episode of this so-called safe asset shortage and where the demand outstripped the supply. Now, surely you've seen the debt to GDP ratios in Japan. How can you possibly say 
Or how can one possibly say that there's a shortage of these securities in light of what appears to be a a massive increase in their supply? That is a fascinating puzzle and and one I attempt to answer in the paper. But, you know, I I think you could ask that same question about the U.S. today, right? We added $5 trillion of debt. So now our nominal stock of debt, the one that matters, marketable proportions around $21, $23 trillion, around 100% debt to GDP. And yet... You know, the 10-year Treasury cannot seem to get above 1.5% and it gets stuck. It's currently a little below that. Same thing in Japan. So in the case of Japan, I mean, just to briefly answer your question, my interpretation is that the real demand for those securities still outstrips or is, is relatively high compared to the supply. So I think the challenge for many people, you know, is that when you look at debt to GDP, you're looking at it from a supply perspective. It's, oh my goodness, it's 200% plus in Japan, it's 100% in, in the US. And you forget there's a demand side, a real demand for these securities. And that's something I got from you, Dave, is you got to look at both sides of the market here. It's too easy to get hung up on one side. And you mentioned this in your work. I mean, one of the key things you need to remember is some of this buildup is an endogenous response. People are desiring to hold those securities. And you think of like the Japanese government or Congress in the US, maybe unconsciously, unwittingly, but they're providing those securities. So the world demands these safe assets drives down interest rates. It kind of enables Congress to do more spending. Maybe it's not the best spending, but it does more. So you can kind of use this growth in debt to GDP as an endogenous response to the safe asset shortage. Oh, that's an excellent answer, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pass your uh, macro prelim, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, th- I think that focusing on supply is a natural tendency. People implicitly have in mind kind of a stable demand, but Economics tells us there's supply and demand, and these things are revealed in the prices, ultimately, inflation and interest rates. How did you go about using this theoretical apparatus to interpret the low inflation? Well, let me lay out the theories how safe assets map onto inflation, because, again, one of the things that motivated me in doing this wasn't just the fact that there's low inflation, but that there wasn't a good story. And although there's been a lot of work on safe assets, there hasn't been a lot of like explicit work trying to tie the low inflation to the safe assets. I mean, the implications in the research, I mean, Ricardo Caballero and again, the late Emmanuel Fari vote Kim, they had a paper where they explicitly show that the safe asset shortage has implications for inflation, but they're all theoretical. There's no like empirical side to it. And it's definitely not like used as a way to explain what happened in the decade before the pandemic. So what I attempted to do was kind of map, you know, that literature onto what we observe in the world. And let me just give you several ways you could do that. And I'll tell you the one that I ultimately end up doing. The first one, which is the Ricardo Caballero approach, kind of a new Keynesian story. You know, you have this elevated demand for safe assets. It drives down safe asset yields. Eventually, you get to the zero lower bound and you still haven't, you know, reached the equilibrium rate may be lower than zero. And as a result, you get an output gap. And that output gap in turn works through a Phillips curve to create low inflation. I know, David, we're not big fans of Phillips curves explanations for low inflation, but that is one theoretical channel that's in the literature. Another way we could think about this is that the increased demand for safe assets will increase future seniorage flows. So even though increased Safe asset demand today is maybe more of a a spot price or or a current observation. It can be used to forecast the future, and that forecast may you know lead investors to think, man, there's going to be a lot more seniorage flows coming into the government, and that's going to make government debt worth more, lower the velocity of that debt, and lead to lower inflation. That's kind of a fiscal theory of the price level story. I think there's some merit to that. And then the angle I take, which is complementary to the one I just described is to view safe asset demand as part of a broader liquidity demand or money demand. So I tell a real money demand shock story in my paper. I I model this in the sense that safe assets, as we mentioned, they maintain their nominal value in a crisis like money. They provide liquidity services like money. They are effectively a form of money. So if you view a broad measure of money, everything from cash to, you know, treasury securities and in between, even some private you know, debt securities, if they're relatively safe, then I, I think you can understand the safe asset shortage from that perspective. And that's how I proceed in the paper. Right. So I really like your interpretation of this just in kind of general terms as kind of money demand, where money is defined kind of much more broadly than is, is commonly done. But just very quickly, what are some things that you think kind of have been driving this? It's a global phenomenon, right? So, I mean, to put it in, you know, basically, we're talking about shifts in the money demand function. 
And then there are forces that are, are driving the money demand, broadly defined to include government securities and other perhaps private label objects. Do you think there are any particular forces at work that are driving this? Is it regulatory, perhaps? Or that's a good question. So I provide a list in the paper, although that's not the main objective of the paper. But I'll run through, I think, the most common ones. Demographics, the aging of advanced economies, is also the aging of China. We see China, we can think of Japan at the forefront, the avant-garde of the aging crisis. Europe's behind them. We're behind Europe. And behind us is coming China. And that's a big chunk of the world population. And, and I know there's some debate about the implications of this for demand for securities. I know Charles Goodhart thinks demographics will lead to higher inflation, but everything we've seen, I mean, Japan to me is a good case study of this. Japan has had demographic problems for a long time now, and all it has done is increase demand for these securities and led to lower inflation. So I think demographics will be with us. It will continue to be a factor weighing down. Two ways I think of it affecting the demand for safe assets. One is you got to save more because you live longer. Or you're going to be in retirement longer. So there's increased demand for safe stores of value. But secondly, it affects you know, the distribution of your portfolio. You're going to be substituting out of equities or other securities into safer ones. And so I think demographics is a part of that. Another part of it, and this story was told by, I think, Ben Bernanke and others early on, is just emerging markets. Now, he called it a global savings glut story. But the basic idea is that parts of the world have grown rapidly because of globalization. You know, China, India, they, they've gained a lot of income, but they haven't had the similar proportionate growth in their institutions that can support you know, that growth. So they don't have the institutional capacity for safe stores of value. So what do they do? They go looking elsewhere in the world and they come to the U.S. I think that's been an important story. Probably still will be, maybe not as much going forward as these countries get richer. Demographics, probably more important. And then a few others might be the regulatory angle that you mentioned, you know, out of Dodd-Frank, banks have to hold more safe assets, other institutions as well. There's been some other stories. I mean, income inequality, there's the argument there that maybe that's driving part of it. And then maybe the last thing I'd mention is financial innovation. I know you've touched on this in your work. And maybe financial innovation really is just a way of restating what we've covered. But financial innovation, so stable coins, money market funds, all these things need some kind of safe asset behind them. And maybe this is just kind of the technological manifestation of the existing safe asset demand. But those are the things I would throw out there. Did I leave anything out, David, you would add? or That was quite a comprehensive list. Yeah. So, you know, this is very intuitive. I think most people can grasp this. If, you know, we hypothesize that despite the, you know, large apparent supply of these global safe assets in the form of JGBs or U.S. Treasury securities that Notwithstanding this large supply, the, evidently the global demand for the product has been outstripping even that supply. And, and that has resulted in downward pressure on interest rates. And to the extent that interest rates can't adjust very much more close to the lower bound that we see the manifestation of this excess demand, so to speak, to manifest itself in lower output, output gaps, low inflation. You can have Phillips curve interpretations if you want or Standard monetarist theories would tell you the same thing as well. So conceptually, I think we have an idea here how this safe assets shortage might contribute to this low inflation episode that has been puzzling Fed policymakers and other people for a long time. But the question is, this is not just what you do in your paper, right? I mean, there's a question of quantitatively, how important might this effect be, assuming it even exists? You also take some time in your paper to do some empirical investigation to address the quantitative question. Can you explain yeah. how you go about doing this? I motivate the empirical part with a theoretical part, not real complicated, but I do have a money in the utility function model. I just kind of show it for the household kind of optimization side of it. I don't do a full DSGE, but I do optimize the household part of the problem. And I show if you include a monetary aggregate that includes government bonds as a form of money, and you get these nice results. You get results that show convenience yield on treasury bonds, you find a lot of interesting results that kind of feed into it. In particular, you can show that there's a common money demand shock that affects traditional money assets as well as these institutional money assets like treasury and treasury yields. In fact, one of the results that falls out of the model is a money demand shock would cause both money velocity to go down as well as the convenience yield to go up or put it more simply, the yield on safe assets to go down. So you get the results that we tend to see and if we actually look around. So if you look at, for example, 10-year treasury yields, they're very correlated with measures of money velocity. They're almost mere opposite of each other. How do you explain that. And I think this is the way you explain there's a common money demand shock driving both, or maybe another way of saying money demand shock driving all these safe asset yields and uses of safe assets. Okay. So empirically, 
set up a vector auto regression for the US. Then I do a panel VAR for 11 advanced economies to see if these results carry through. And you know what I find, I'll just briefly describe the impulse response functions, that a money demand shock does lower treasury yields, does lower velocity. It also lowers inflation. And it also leads to central banks increasing their balance sheets in response and policy rates dropping. So you get all the theoretical outcomes you'd expect. But how important is that's the question you're asking? So what? You know, it's an interesting story. Does it really matter? And with VARs, it's a little tricky. It's not like a typical regression. You come up with an R squared of, you know, I explained 50% of the inflation. It's a little different, but I still have a way to kind of get a handle on this. Two things. First, do a forecast variance decomposition. So you look at the percent of the forecast error that the model generates empirically that can be explained by these shocks. And what I end up with is about a quarter, 25% at most, about 25% of the forecast error in inflation. And I look at headline core in the deflator. You know, it's not like a majority, but it's still important. You imagine 25% of inflation being driven by these money demand shocks, safe asset shocks. That's definitely a significant number. And that's over the whole sample. So it doesn't really maybe explain specifically 2010 through 2019. So in order to do that, I do a counterfactual exercise with the estimated model. And yes, we have the Lucas critique here in the background screaming at me when I do this. But what the counterfactual does is it allows us to get a sense of magnitudes. And that's, again, answering your question. So what I do is I I take the estimated model and I start from 2010 and I do a dynamic forecast forward using this model where I plug in values for the 10-year treasury yield as if they would have returned to more normal pre-2008 levels. So the assumption here is that somehow the government satiates safe asset demand issuing more debt or fiscal policy, monetary policy work in a way we have solved this problem. Problem, and we return, you know, the uh, ten-year treasury, and I do it over different levels: four and a half, five, five and a half percent. What happens? And what I find is, on average, you'd have inflation about one percent higher over this period than we currently experience. So you think of the PCE being about 50 basis points below two. My results say if you could get the ten-year treasury up to five and a half percent, then you would have inflation about two and a half percent. It is a sizable number. It, again, it's subject to the Lucas critique, but it gives some sense of magnitudes. I also did a counterfactual from nominal GDP using this approach, and it's several trillion dollars larger by 2019. So what I find is that both the yields on Treasury, the inflation rate, and nominal GDP all are affected by the safe asset demand as a part of a broader phenomenon of real money demand shocks. So that's a sizable number, I would say. But if you were, I don't know, just based on this work and perhaps what else you might know or believe, I mean, if you were in charge, say the Congress or the Fed together, let's say you're very powerful, let's consolidate the two. I'm not sure if your model speaks to this, but what would you kind of actually do as a practical policy matter to kind of alleviate or solve this safe asset shortage issue. I'm not even going to call it a problem. Is it a problem? What are the implications here exactly for policy? I mean, perhaps we know we might be able to get the inflation rate up higher, but would that have been a good policy and why? I mean, how do you think about this question? I don't know. A good, tough question. So maybe problem is the wrong word. I think there's several ways we could address this issue, this question. One of the reasons I think we can call it a problem is because markets aren't doing their work. The reason we have a safe asset shortage because yields get down to the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound, maybe it's you know a little bit lower, and rates aren't allowed to drop farther down, which another way of saying that is prices aren't allowed to clear the market. And so markets aren't working. So you could think one possible solution would be, well, let's remove that institutional constraint. Let's make negative interest rates as common as positive interest rates. You know, let's allow that flexibility into play. And that could be one possible solution. The Fed starts doing negative rates, at least theoretically. I'm just not sure policy wise how practical that is. So, you know, we've seen the ECB do it and the ECB goes a little bit below zero. I guess Sweden and Switzerland and Denmark have had some negative interest rates. I'm not sure there's the political will to really do what would be needed on negative interest rates because it's a politically very sensitive thing to sell to the public. We want to, you know, give you negative interest rates. Why not? I mean, if there's a shortage of safe facets, I mean, it seems like the obvious solution sounds like just to make more of them. 
that's another solution. Issue more of them. I was going to get to that as well, right? So <laughs> instead of trying to play at the price, move that barrier, just let's prop it back up by issuing more securities. As you know, I mean, as we've talked about today, people look at debt to GDP and they freak out about that too, right? They freak out about negative interest rates. They freak out about the supply of nominal government debt. So the solution I thought about, in fact, I'm working on another paper with a colleague at Mercatus about this, is assuming this continues to still be a problem and all signs point that, again, 10-year treasury, 20-year treasuries are at super low values, then it might behoove the U.S. government to set up a sovereign wealth fund where it takes some of that fiscal space, some of that capacity, and this sovereign wealth fund effectively issues its own treasuries, takes in the money, reinvests it in higher risk stuff, earns a dividend for the population. This could be kind of a form of the, you know, the UBI for the masses, you know. Maybe if you don't want to hand it out, you save it for a rainy day. I mean, Norway has a sovereign wealth fund they use with their oil resources. And so, One way to look at this, if this continues to be a problem, you can think of the U.S. having the resource issue where we're the main provider of safe assets. So we're not providing oil, providing safe assets. Find a responsible way to use it. One thing I am concerned about debt, but there's a couple of issues, I guess, on debt. But one thing that does bother me is that the safe asset demand lowers yields and it enables Congress to spend in my view, recklessly sometimes or without much thought? Is it really going to have a high return on the amount of spending we're doing? And I think a sovereign wealth fund would impose some discipline on that gift from the world to the U.S. Right. Very good. Well, we're buttoning up against the time here, Dave. But I, just before we go, I just wanted to ask you quickly, what big lessons did the pandemic teach you about economic policy? You talked to a lot of people. You've given a lot of thought and you've been an astute observer of policy responses, both domestically and around the world. What big lessons did you learn from the pandemic in this regard? Well, I think acting quickly is probably a lesson we've learned. We mentioned on the macro policy front that government did act relatively quickly, maybe not in the most efficient manner, but acted quickly. But I've had Alex Taberick on the show, and you know he's been a big critic of the FDA's ability to get these vaccines through quickly. He's also been, I think, very astutely correct on better planning for tele-events. You know? So he's also a colleague of mine. He's at GME, but he's also at Mercatus Center. He's advocated for more planning for tele-events like an asteroid hitting Earth or a solar flare knocking out our electric grid, things like that. We need more preparation. We don't think about them, and, and then when they do hit us, we're not prepared for them. I think it's important to be thinking about televents, to have relatively quick, you know, macro responses. And that may mean you need to set it up ahead of time. So maybe bigger automatic stabilizers, a better monetary policy rule and such. And again, the other thing I would, again, encourage listeners, any government officials listening to this, any central bankers listening to this, look at what was accomplished. You know, the big takeaway from this pandemic, we closed a hole so quickly. So I encourage them to take the win, as I mentioned earlier. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. It's time to wrap up here because I know your podcast only runs for an hour. I could do this for another hour, but I just want to end here to say thank you so much on behalf of all of your listeners, all of your fans, and myself included. I really enjoyed listening to your podcast and had the honor of actually being a guest on your show on more than one occasion. Thank you so much. And we all look forward to the next 314 podcasts. Fantastic. Well, thank you, David. I guess this means I get to get a nominal GDP targeting mug now that I'm a guest. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, David. You too. Thank you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.